Hello and welcome to Indian Standard Time. I'm Siddharth Vardarajan. It's been more than a year since 276 schoolgirls were kidnapped by Boko Haram in Nigeria. Joining me to discuss this terrible tragedy which has gone unresolved and is largely underreported is Obiageli Ezek Wesley, Nigerian activist, co-founder of Bring Back Our Girls. Welcome to the show. Thank you so very much. Let's start, uh, Obi, with um, an update, if you will. Um, April 2014 is when 276 girls were kidnapped bor in Borno State. Uh, how many of them still remain in captivity, and what do we know about where they might be? Um, 219 of those girls are still missing. Um, parents lay claim to them, and um, out of those parents, about uh, 14 of them have since died, heartbroken, without uh, seeing their children. Um, so mother and father both have died, parents have died? Some have okay. lost parent okay. mothers, okay. some okay. have lost fathers. Right. Uh, in, in a particular case, both parents are gone. Um, the latest update is really that we're no closer to knowing where the girls are today than we were um, in April 2014 when this occurrence first um, uh, happened. The sad thing is that we know that in abduction cases, the first 72 hours matter most. In this particular case, tragically, today is day 584 since those girls were taken away by savages that dared to question their choice to be educated in order that they could have as good a life as you and I have had simply because of the opportunity of knowledge. The w condition in which these girls were abducted uh, was one that speaks to the heroism of those girls. The northeast zone from where they were abducted was already under emergency rule as a result of the insurgency activities and yet those girls dead to go to school. And, and so it is almost incomprehensible that young women who dared to get educated would be quickly forgotten by the world. It shouldn't happen. Because every time that the world spends any of its energy trying to get many more girls into the classroom, exactly. the fact that we failed this particular set of girls would stare us in the face and question our credibility. What is the uh, what, what was the age range of these girls? Oh, they were taken when they were, when they were kidnapped. They would be 16, 15, 16, 17, because they were taking their final secondary school. And this was in a government school, actually, right? Yes, yeah. it was in a government school. So they were taking their final secondary school certification. By now, a number of them would have gone on to pursue higher studies, either in colleges of education, universities, polytechnics, but it's almost two years. What do we know about uh, why that particular school was targeted? What, was the, what were the events lead that led up to this uh, kidnapping? Were there, there, were there threats from Boko Haram? Were there uh, any indications or intelligence uh, uh, reports that such a, such a horrible uh, attack might happen? Well, you know, I mean, the, the, the um, Boko Haram at that point in time had become, had waxed very strong and had, you know, taken some of the catchment of territories around the Northeast Zone. And so their actions were based on impunity and um, clearly uh, based on the fact that they could terrorize wherever they wanted to terrorize. Mm -hmm. they, they had... They seemed to have the upper hand at that time, and our military was hardly present. And so Chibok, the city from where the girls were abducted, um, was in the line of their part. And, and so they, it may have been a random act. It may have been a delib an, an, an orchestrated one. Whichever one it is, right. the, the point is those girls were not safe. They were not secure even though they had voted for education. 
And, and so, you know, be, be beyond my country government uh, owing those girls a responsibility, we as a global community owe the girls a responsibility. At any, any time that a girl child is under threat anywhere in the world, we're all under threat. Right. We all are. Now, you said uh, 219 are still in captivity, mm -hmm. which means about 50... Some managed, 59 of them. How did, yeah. they, how did they manage to feed themselves? What, what, was them. the, what were the circumstances under which they... Different. Uh, it was right. quite diverse. Some of them on that night, as they were being hauled off their school uh, in <laughs> the truckloads uh, of them, they had to escape from, from, from so this moving is vehicles. The first 72 hours that you speak about, actually. Yes. Yeah, yeah. This, they actually... And then some of them were taken into the Boko Haram camp in the Sambisa forest. But they, they plotted to, you know, because it's, they said it's a sprawling camp with all kinds of people. And so they, they mastered their environment and sometimes, you know, sort of plotted how to go as though wanting to ease themselves and then started running and realized that they actually could escape. Um, so you had those diverse ways that they managed to escape, but 57 of them did. Some of them uh, at this time are schooling in the United States. The rest of them are schooling at home in Nigeria, okay. uh, pursuing their education again. But they've left Borno uh, well, State, I guess. Most uh, majority yeah. of Would them, have moved there's, there's, but, none, yeah. there's none, you know, they're in school. Yeah, so. yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I think that the, 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 the point that you raised in, in your intro about the world moving on and, and it likely being underreported is, is so true um, and must not be allowed to happen because this is an open sore on the conscience of the world. Um, what would we say we all did um, at a time that our civilization was assaulted uh, by a bunch of savages right. who uh, is, is essentially are saying right. to children yeah. that they have no right to yeah. education. I, I'll come to the global response or lack of it in, uh, in a few minutes, but I, I just wanted to understand a little bit more about um, the kidnapping itself and what we know. Uh, the 57 girls who did manage to escape, based on what they have said or testified, do we have a better understanding of what the Boko Haram's plans are or what, you know, what the you know, what is the intention behind this? Where do they see this going? Do they plan to step up attacks on and stage more kidnappings? Do we have any sense of... Oh, there's a on lot. The base, based on what these girls reported? No, but there's a lot that's happened. Mm. You know, I mean, <laughs> it's also part of the, uh, the point that you were making. My goodness, the country has gone through terrible tragedies since April 14th. So, you know, you don't, the book, uh, Boko Haram doesn't publish its plans, but yeah. it's been acting. Right. you know, in very horrendous manner uh, over the course of the year and a half that these girls have been in their enclave. So there have been thousands of deaths. Um, it is only uh, recently as we um, got a new government uh, in elected and um, the military leaders were changed and uh, some revamping of the security infrastructure happened uh, we now um, have our military um, recovering most of the territories Tenshi. that were occupied previously uh -huh. by Boko Haram. Uh, Maidaguri they, town, I mean, various places have been liberated yes, in a way. Yes, uh, yeah. and then there have been rescue of citizens we did not even know had been kidnapped. Um, the, we, we, we knew about our Chibok girls and it was clear that those girls were missing because parents were screaming and saying, where are the children we sent to school? But there had been other women, children, men that had been abducted from their villages. And, um, you know, in recent times, we've seen many numbers of these people being rescued and uh, being uh, uh, helped, t t t t you know, through a lot of uh, therapy to, to reconstruct their lives. Um, so, Boko Haram is simply another scourge on the world. 
they're as bad as any of their kind anywhere right. in the world, whether right. it's Al-Qaeda or it's I ISIS or it's any other thing they call themselves. Yeah. They, they basically seek to assault our modern civilization. Right. And the question is whether all of us would sit and allow that happen. But Especially the question is whether the leaders of the free world would sit, right. navel gaze, and watch this come down the path of everyone, including those who assume that it would never happen right. in their own place. Now, now tell me something about your own personal journey and your own involvement, because now you, you were uh, vice president uh, of the World Bank's Africa division, and you, you chucked that to become a co-founder of Bring Back Our Girls Now. Uh, tell us something about what motivated you to do this. Was it your sense of disgust at the fact that this issue was not getting the prominence it was getting? And that um, you probably also know that I, I was Minister of Education for my country before I was Vice President at the World Bank. Um, one of the areas of important reform for me as a Minister of Education was, a, was to bridge the parity uh, between girls in school and boys in school. And uh, the Northeast Zone, where the uh, Chibo girls were abducted from, um, was then and still is the zone in Nigeria with the least parity uh, between boys and girls. In terms of enrollment girls, rates. In terms of okay. enrollment rates and the attainment in education. Okay. And so it was important to get more girls into school. So we put massive resources behind the advocacy okay. and, the, and the effort to get girls in school. So there is a personal connection to that. Okay. I believe absolutely in the fact that if you want to equalize opportunities in any society, you, the best way to do it is education. Economic history proves that. So for me, it was important that we should demonstrate that it is not our oil that is important, that it's our human beings, and that our human beings deserve the dignity of life. And that if our girls or our sons are taken away by anyone, it's an affront to all of us. And we cannot be a country or a nation state properly so-called if we could ignore the abduction of our own citizens. And so I had been a voice on the issues of poor governance. And here I was saying poor governance manifest itself in the most egregious manner because we were going to just look away while children are taken by terrorists. So I was a voice for them from the very beginning. In fact, before the abduction, 59 young men had been slaughtered in cold blood in their um, boarding school and burned to ashes. It was at that time in February um, that I had spoken so loudly to my government and said, surely this is going to change the dynamics of this war with Boko Haram. We need to make a clear statement that we would not be a nation that allows them to run amok on our soil doing this to our children. But nothing happened. So when it happened with our Chibo girls, I said, I yes, am not going to okay. stop. This is going to be persistent until there is positive closure. Uh, so, so tell us something about the, the activities of Bring Back Our Girls Now. Um, is it, is it a, a, a pressure group on the government? Are you building public awareness? What kind of response do you get from uh, ordinary Nigerians? It's everything. I mean, in the early days of the girls' abduction, nobody even you know, in government acknowledged them. So we became their voice to bring their matter to the fore. So it was serious awareness creation that caught on around the world and compelled our government to pay attention and to act, begin to do some actions. And then it became a sustained movement saying, these girls must be found. Don't give up on these girls. So the pressure you know, continued through us. And we have stayed on uh, despite the change in government because, um, and, and met with the new government and still holding on and saying the matter of these girls must be resolved. Either which way you resolve it, but there must be a closure. 
you can have an open-ended situation exactly. where girls vanished into the air and we all moved on. We can't move on without our Chiba girls being resolved. That's what our movement stands for. Right. And, you know, when I speak to uh, um, audience, uh, when I speak to um, in countries like yours, I normally say to people to not assume that it's so far away. Because right now, the whole of our civilization is under, is under assault. And so it may be cheaper girls today. God forbid that it should be any set of girls anywhere else in the world. That's why the world must act together. Whatever it would take for citizens of all countries to keep a voice out there, right. saying this matter must be resolved, using every voice that they can, um, calling on their governments and saying, how have you supported the government of Nigeria right. to gather right. important intelligence that we need right. in order to locate these girls right. is well worth it. Now, we've seen in the last 10 years um, African countries across the board making remarkable strides in terms of the quality of governance, uh, establishing democratic governments, uh, even the AU or ECOWAS, for example, acting against military, you know, in Mali, for example, or Burkina Faso, we saw. Uh, these are very positive signs. Mm. Now, what I don't understand is Nigeria is a democracy. You mm. have a free press. How is it that uh, 276 girls can be kidnapped and the government doesn't treat this as an absolute emergency priority? Why should it have taken any activism or any time uh, one would have thought that the instinct of political survival in a democracy would push a president or a minister to ensure that no stone is left unturned uh, in order to find these girls. I don't know about you, but sometimes it's the hardest thing to do is psychoanalytics of politicians. And so, you know, you look at um, what the political incentives may have been for that particular administration to not have bothered about those girls until it became an escalated uh, incident. And you, you can't find the reasonable answer for that. Um, my, my sense is that it, it was all you know, woven around so many complexities of, um, uh, of relationship between the then government and what he perceived to be um, a, an, 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 an a lack of acceptance of his um, of his of his person by the northern part of the country, and and so it had become so so intricate and woven around um, politics. We should not be. The dignity of the human life is devoid of politics. A human being is a human being is a human being, and when you are a leader, the only thing that should matter to you is that any of your citizens is in harm's way. It doesn't matter if by saving that citizen, they turn around and call you names. <laughs> you know, that's what a leader, a leader takes abuses, gets insulted. That's what leadership is all yeah. about. It's about sacrifice. And that, that, that was something that was missing in that particular uh, uh, situation. We, we kind of have something slightly better uh, in the sense that the, the new government, although not the ones there when this happened, have taken full ownership and agreed that they have a democratic accountability to citizens concerning... So uh, how does the president respond? The president responds positively to, uh, to your campaign now? Is yes. There, is there much because, greater... I mean, in the past, you know, in the, with the previous administration, uh, they, they used the police against us. That's, you know, a, that's astonishing. It was amazing. That's it, astonishing. Was, it was so bizarre. It's one of the bizarrest things I could ever have seen in life. Um, the, 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 so with what they, they, attempted, been... they attempted to ban us as a movement. On, on what they, grounds? Because they just didn't want us to continue to call attention to this matter. And so they decided that, oh, you know, you're only campaigning for this because you don't like our government. You prefer the opposition, opposition. party. And this is all some orchestration. And for me, that was so annoying. It was so annoying because everybody knows me in the country to not have anything to do with some political prejudice or whatever. I am just so straight like an arrow on the matter of justice. These guys, these guys were not giving justice. 
to these to these young women. And I felt that the reason that they were being deprived of justice was clearly their social status. If those girls were the daughters of people like myself, you know, there is no way I would have needed to be screaming on the street that they be rescued. So, so they were rural, that, they, poor, these were, poor families? These were poorer segments of the society. And so you were basically saying that if you're poor, you don't have a voice. No, I'm sorry, I don't agree. Whether you're rich, you're poor, you're nothing, you have a voice and you have dignity that must be protected. And so, you know, so that, that was the basis of all of those challenges. But right now, the, the present government has taken ownership where we met with the president. Where it was a simple request that we had made of the previous government and said the president needed to meet with citizens who were worried about the safety of these girls and to speak to us and their parents on the plans that the that the government was making concerning their rescue. The government turned it into some adversarial thing and it went downhill from then. This current administration has taken ownership. So we are more collaborative in sort of saying we are standing, trusting that you will not drop the ball on these girls because we do want this to come to closure. And, and they are doing what they can to Three days or so ago before I, I left home, I, I had met with the vice president to remind them again of the promises that had been made concerning um, a successful search and rescue for our Chibo girls. They are better, as, as they say, with intelligence gathering, uh, they have put a, a, a target um, of end of December for when they believe that they can eradicate the uh, Boko Haram. But does the so army have a sense that, of... That's a tough one. I, you know, it might not happen, but the fact that the president said that we cannot say we have defeated Boko Haram without the rescue of our Chibo girls, that's a very powerful statement. It's a very strong commitment, and we're holding the president. But as of now, the army doesn't have specific intelligence about where the girls may be held. Not if, that they have... Or indeed whether they're being held altogether. They have right? not shared that with right. us yet. And, your and we are not going to speculate. Right. Um, obviously, the primary or the front, front line of this fight is in Nigeria and being waged by the Nigerian government. But what is it that the international community ought to do that, that it's not doing? I think that more of inf intelligence gathering, okay. information sharing, uh, and basically understanding that, that terrorism is a global public bad. Right. In the same way we have global public good, we have global public bad. And terrorism is the most significant global public bad that we have now. Terrorism has no boundaries. It, you cannot sort of erect walls against terrorism anymore. We now know that with the power of technology and the kind of ideological indoctrination that happens through all more kinds of platforms, that the terrorists might actually be your own citizen, working with people that can never come to your own land. And so global collaboration and cooperation and using all the mechanisms that bring leaders together to find common solutions, to pool ideas and knowledge and technologies. The truth is, we are a world where we, we, we find ourselves awash with the most intrusive of technologies. When it comes to matters of terrorism, we need to align them better and use them as effectively as possible to protect our common citizens in particular. On that note, we will have to end it here. Um, I'm sure everybody watching this program and the whole of India uh, wishes you every success in your struggle to recover the Chibok girls. I must thank the people here in India who during that period joined us in chanting, bring back our girls. They mustn't stop. Right. The girls are not yet back. Right. Obi Ezek Wesley, thank you very much for joining us thank from you. RSTV. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. That wraps up this episode of IST. Do join us again next week with another guest. Thank you for watching.